Well, I think uh, um, these people are still trickling in, but we might as well get started since we're a couple minutes after. Uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, uh, viewing today and thank you to our, our guests. I think it's gonna be a great event, a special, uh, a special edition, I guess, of the, the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. Uh, with me today, so I'm Jonathan Bidlack. I'm the Interim Director of the Governance Program at the R Street Institute. Um, and with me is my colleague, Anthony Markham, who's a resident fellow in the Governance Department, uh, who focuses on federal judiciary and separation of powers issues. And that we also have two very esteemed guests who are both going to be discussing their, their new books. Um, and as you may know, they have very similar names, uh, Ilya Soman and Ilya Shapiro. So uh, I'll make sure to, to minimize uh, confusion perhaps as much as I can. Um, I was, I guess, going to, uh, keeping with the theme, we have the ferns behind me. I was going to introduce myself as Zach Galifianakis, but uh, might have might have confused some people who might not have gotten the reference. But um, so just to introduce our, our guests to start off There's with. One more distinction between the Ilias is that I totally get the reference. I'm up with the lingo and Ilias <laughs> has no idea what. <laughs> <laughs> right, we can say the hip Ilya, I suppose, if that's, <laughs> if that helps. Um, so I guess to start off to introduce Ilya Soman, um, uh, Ilya is the professor of law at George Mason University uh, with research focusing on constitutional law, property law, democratic theory, federalism, and migration rights, which is actually uh, the topic of the book we'll be discussing. Uh, he is the author of several books, uh, including Democracy and Political Ignorance, Why Smaller Government is Smarter, uh, and The Grasping Hand about the Kilo Case uh, by University of Chicago Press. And most recently, the book that we'll be discussing today uh, free to Move, Foot Voting, Migration, and Political Freedom, which is just out from, from Oxford University Press. And uh, his work, in addition, has appeared in many scholarly journals, uh, the Yale Law Journal, Stanford Law Journal, Georgetown Law Journal, many others, uh, and has also had pieces in everywhere from the Washington Post, the Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, you name it. Um, his pieces have also been cited, perhaps most importantly, by the, the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, many state Supreme Courts and federal courts. And uh, he holds a BA uh, from Amherst College, his master's in political science from Harvard, and his JD from Yale Law School. So welcome, Ilya Soman. And uh, our, our second guest is Ilya Shapiro. Uh, Ilya is the, the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Congressional, uh, sorry, Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. He previously was a special assistant uh, to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues and practice at Patton Boggs and clearly uh, uh, Gottlieb. He's the author or co-author of two books, uh, Religious Liberties for Corporations, Hobby Lobby, The Affordable Care Act, and The Constitution from 2014. And the book that we'll be discussing today, uh, which is just out, uh, Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations and the Politics of America's Highest Court. Ilya's writings have also appeared in uh, many places, Wall Street Journal, the, the Washington Post, uh, LA Times, USA Today. I'm sure I forgot many others. Uh, he is a legal consultant to CBS News, and perhaps most importantly, fitting perhaps with the hip the hip theme, as he did once appear on the Colbert Report. So I suppose that might be another uh, another distinguishing characteristic. Um, Ilya has his AB from Princeton University, his master's from the LSE, and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School. So uh, thank you both for for joining us today. I think this will be an interesting discussion. These are uh, related books, although they are on different topics. I think they're related in the sense that. You know, both of them talk a little bit about constitutional structure and uh, suggest uh, decentralization and, and limiting government as a, uh, a solution to some of their problems and so that, they, that they're uh, addressing. And so um, I thought I would start off with you, Ilya Soman, um, and, you know, maybe you can, um, you know, tell our, our viewers, our listeners, the thesis of your book and, and your motivation in, in writing it. And then, and then I think Ilya Shapiro, if you, if you might do the same, that would be a good place to start. So the thesis, I think, is much more important than my motivation because the latter is a bit idiosyncratic. Uh, the point of the book is to make the case for expanding people's opportunities to vote with their feet in three different types of foot voting. One is foot voting within a federal system where you choose what state or local government to live in based at least in part on the government policies. Another is foot voting in the private sector where many private sector organizations actually provide goods and services that are similar to those provided, especially by state and local governments, for example, private planned communities. And finally, through international migration, uh, which is the most controversial type of foot voting, but also the one where I argue uh, that there is the greatest benefit. Uh, and I think this has enormous benefits in terms of expanding people's options for political choice. Uh, 
It also expands human freedom along many other dimensions. It, in addition, has the potential to massively promote economic growth throughout the world. If we had free mobility throughout the world, economists estimate that the world GDP would be about twice as high as it currently is. And by breaking down barriers to mobility within the US, uh, we can also achieve tremendous economic gains as well by empowering people to move to places where there are better job opportunities. Uh, and finally, a key part of the thesis is that normally a lot of people don't think of the importance of foot voting as a method of political choice uh, because they see the real political choice as what we do at the ballot box uh, that like we're about to do in the current election or for many people already have done through mail-in ballots. And I think voting at the ballot box is valuable and important, but it has two major weaknesses. Uh, one is that the chance that your vote will make a difference is extremely small about one in 60 million on average in a presidential election. Uh, in most cases, we wouldn't say you have meaningful freedom of choice if you have only a one in 60 million chance of determining the outcome. We wouldn't say if you have meaningful religious freedom, for example, if you have only a one in 60 million chance of de determining what faith you wanna practice. And in addition, precisely because the odds of making a difference are so low, uh, it turns out for most voters, there's very little incentive to seek out relevant knowledge uh, when you go to the ballot box. And in fact, the data overwhelmingly showed that most voters know very little about government and public policy. For example, only about a third can even name the three branches of the federal government. Whereas on the other hand, uh, uh, it turns out that Foot voting is better on both of these dimensions. If you're allowed to vote with your feet at all, it's a choice that really will make a difference. Uh, there's a high likelihood of doing so. And precisely for that reason, lots of data as well as common sense indicate that foot voters devote a lot more time and effort to seeking out relevant information uh, than ballot box voters. I also in the book discuss a lot of different objections to expanded foot voting, particularly expanded international migration rights. And we might talk about, about that later today. Finally, as to my motivation, many people I think assume that I was motivated by one of two things, either because I'm an immigrant myself uh, from the Soviet Union, so I would be sympathetic to migration rights for that reason, or because I'm a libertarian and I wanna limit government intervention. Of course, restrictions on freedom of movement are a major form of government intervention. And that second motive probably does play some role for me and the, the first one perhaps even as well. But what really drew me to this topic is that I started out as a student of federalism and talking about internal migration. And I wrote a number of articles about that over a period of years early in my career. Then I gradually realized it probably should have dawned on me earlier that international migration is in many ways the same kind of phenomenon as voting with your feet within a country. It has many of the same advantages only to a, great extent, a greater extent. And yet most of the academic literature and even the popular literature on these subjects, uh, they treat internal foot voting and international migration completely separately without even be noticing the similarities between the two. So I thought, you know, this is an opportunity for me to sort of plug this hole in the literature and also plug as well what seems to be a gap between the left and the right. Uh, the crudely speaking, people on the left tend to be sympathetic to international migration, but very suspicious of internal foot voting, which they view as a race to the bottom or as something that can only benefit the wealthy. Whereas many conservatives have the opposite set of assumptions. Uh, they trumpet the virtues of internal foot voting. They say it's great that Texas is attracting people from blue states. That shows how wonderful Texas is. But when it's somebody crossing over into Texas, not from California, but from Mexico, then they say, no, 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 we got to stop that. That's very dangerous. It's a problem. So what I would like to say is that essentially the left to a large extent is right about international migration, uh, but the right, at least to a large extent, is right about internal foot voting uh, and to have greater political freedom and a freer and wealthier society. We should have more of both. Uh, so I'll stop there, one but I, I very that, much uh, look forward to you, one thing. One thing that unites both uh, Ilya Soman and I is that we both have uh, immigrated, uh, although uh, I like immigrating even more than he does. I've done it twice from Russia to Canada and from Canada to the U.S. Uh, but notably, a big distinction is that I'm originally from Moscow and he's originally from St. Petersburg. So that explains the huge gap in our 
uh, perceptions and, and worldviews, myself uh, being a hard headed realist and, and Ilya being more of a poet about things and more of a romantic, uh, that sort of, of thing. Uh, so uh, my book, uh, I will tell you about my motivation because I, I think that's somewhat uh, important. I, I, I'd, I've long wanted to write a book about the Supreme Court. I've been a professional court watcher as it were for, I guess, since I joined Cato uh, just over 13 years ago. And uh, in the wake of the Kavanaugh process two years ago, I thought, you know, like most people observing, this is just disgusting. This is a big mess. Uh, the same toxic cloud that uh, has that envelops all of. Well, how did we get here, right? You know, those of us who pay attention to the court or constitutional law, you know, you're well aware of the history going back to Robert Bork, say, 33 years ago, 1987. But the world didn't start with Robert Bork. So, you know, what role has politics played uh, going back to the origins of our republic? I wanted to find out. And then, uh, what what have we learned over this grand sweep of time? Uh, what can be done about it? What should be done about it to fix the situation, assuming we're diagnosing it correctly. Uh, one interesting thing I found is that politics has always been part of the process of judicial nominations and, and confirmations. I mean, it shouldn't be surprising. After all, the Constitution gives the power to the president, who's a politician, to nominate, and with the advice and consent of the Senate, and senators also being politicians, to appoint uh, judges to the Supreme Court. That's all, this, that's all the Constitution says about it. And from the very beginning, political considerations have come to the fore. George Washington, who uh, obviously had to stand up uh, the new government, as well as nominate the very first Supreme Court justices, um, had, you know, different interest regional uh, uh, other other inter nominees rejected. So right off the bat, we had political contention. In fact, uh, more than half of our presidents have had some sorts of problems getting nominees confirmed. Uh, over the grand sweep of history, about three quarters of nominees have been confirmed. Uh, others have been uh, not just rejected, but withdrawn, not acted upon. Merrick Garland was by no means the first one of those. Uh, or I love this euphemism in Senate procedure, postponed indefinitely. John Quincy Adams had one of his nominees post indefinitely. Uh, uh, Adams himself actually had, had declined the opportunity to serve on, on. There are people who declined after they were confirmed. Communities happened uh, you know, sometimes the same day. Uh, and then you know, if you're a prominent lawyer in Boston or uh, a justice on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, why would you want this seeming demotion? You'd have to move to the swamp you have to work in the basement of the Senate. The Supreme Court didn't get a, its own building until the 1930s. And you'd have to ride circuit, literally on horseback, to the far-flung uh, states of the early republic. You know, no, thank you. Um, but anyway, you know, politics has played a role in different ways. Uh, the issue of slavery, uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution, Reconstruction, the Progressive Era, you know, different, um, uh, sometimes mapping on party lines, sometimes dividing in, in different ways. In the early 20th century, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft looked at potential nominees, quote unquote, real politics rather than uh, their party labels or, or other sorts of things. How are they going to rule on, for Teddy Roosevelt, uh, antitrust, trust busting, right? Or other progressive goals. For, for Taft, a more of a deregulatory classical liberal uh, mean uh, uh, was what he was looking for. Uh, so what's changed now in the modern era, which uh, in my book, I, I point to 1968 as the inflection that starts the modern era in terms of looking at judicial philosophy and, and things like this. 1968, a key pivot point in our cultural and political history, but also uh, our legal history. And uh, like Gaul, my book is divided into three with the past being the first part, the present, the modern era, the second part, and the uh, future reform proposals uh, as the third part. But what's changed now uh, is that, first of all, over the course of decades, power has become centralized in Washington, preventing the sorts of uh, foot voting and, and, or, or, or lowering the impact of, of foot voting that uh, Ilya discusses uh, in his book. Um, uh, and at the same time, uh, we have divergent legal theories uh, mapping onto partisan preferences at a time when the parties are more ideologically sorted 
and polarized, and they've been since at least the Civil War, if not ever. So when one of these powerful, precious seats uh, opens up, ruling on half a dozen or more of the most important political controversies in the country every year because of a warping of our federalism and of separation of powers, well, of course, there's going to be a zero-sum game, uh, compromised, impossible, politically fraught battle. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's where we are. Great. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, and I can kick off there. And Ilya, and I'll be doing most of my questions to Ilya Shapiro, focus on his book. Unfortunately, I only have one copy with me. I don't have the, the few that you have well, behind well, you. you. know, I would advise, I put a link there there's a problem with Ilya Shapiro's internet connection. Well, okay, well, I, I hope we'll power through it. Um, um, uh, I've posted the links to my book and a free appendix that you can, you can download. Um, but uh, I, I do recommend not just be, buying one book and not just buying you know, multiple uh, uh, media of the book. You can get it on Audible or Kindle or a CD, but you might just want multiple hard copies upstairs, downstairs, if your significant other is reading at the same time as you. For that matter, if you want to read it twice, you might want a second copy because clearly you're going to be taking notes and marking down the first time. Maybe you want a, a clean read the second time. Anyway, go ahead, Anthony. <laughs> Sure. So well, it's, it's good for everyone to know that. So I, I think, you know, as you mentioned, one of my questions was going to talk about, you did divide the book into three pieces. You talked, looked at the past, what you labeled the present and the future. And I think the book had really good and helpful anecdotes from the past. You know, your introduction talks about Byron White's hearing, which was not very, very different than the type of hearing that we saw with either Justice Barrett or Justice Kavanaugh, or even some of the hearings before that. So what sort of lessons for people who are looking at the court today, looking at how confirmation hearings are treated today, what sort of lessons can they take from the past or look at in the past, maybe pre-68, and apply that? Well... What kind of lessons from the past can we apply? That's an interesting freezing pose by, by Anthony there. Anyway, uh, one thing I'd note is that the idea of misfires, you know, you might be familiar with especially Republican presidents nominating people and then not perhaps getting the jurisprudence they expected or wanted. Uh, and this isn't just uh, John Roberts of late. It's also uh, David Souter under George H.W. Bush or uh, under Nixon, Harry Blackman under Eisenhower, Earl Warren, and uh, Bill Brennan. Um, but that didn't start in the modern era or with modern Republican uh, presidents for whatever reason. Woodrow Wilson, who uh, we can you know, debate his theories another time, but he was a professor of jurisprudence, very learned in this, had a very strong, firm view of um, what kind of constitutional order he wanted. He had three opportunities to nominate justices and went three very, very different ways. Uh, one was Louis Brandeis in 1916, another presidential election year. And this is actually considered to be the very most controversial nomination we've had. Not Bork, not Thomas, Kavanaugh, 2016 with Garland de Gorsuch, or, or now, uh, I consider 1916. Brandeis was the first Jewish nominee and also a crusading progressive, had very controversial legal policy views. His confirmation took more than four months, the longest we've ever had. The ultimate vote was uh, not as close as some of the more recent ones, but still very, very contentious. And uh, the first so contentious that the Senate for the first time convened uh, uh, hearings. That wasn't a thing before that. Uh, but it was seen as unseemly for the nominee himself to testify, so they just had outside witnesses pro uh, and con. But once he was confirmed, that wasn't the end of it. After that, his new colleague, Charles Evans Hughes, resigned to run against Woodrow Wilson in that fall's presidential election. So again, if you think uh, you know 2020 or 2016 had the most uh, intrigue between the Supreme Court and the presidential politics, I'll see that and, and raise you 1916. So that's Brandeis. Then Wilson had William Clark McReynolds, who's this cantankerous, bigoted guy, uh, uh, very retrograde in, in a lot of his views, ended up becoming what uh, was labeled one of the four horsemen who were thwarting uh, FDR's uh, New Deal and, and prompting eventually his uh, failed court packing scheme, but uh, you know had nothing in common with Woodrow Wilson uh, other than the bigotry, I guess, and antitrust. They were simpatico on antitrust, but nothing else. Really remarkable, very different from Brandeis. And then his third nominee, uh, uh, John Heston Clark, uh, did not leave, leave a, a lasting legacy uh, uh, at all. So again, 
even if a president knows exactly what he wants uh, and is his own best advisor on constitutional issues, you can have these sorts of misfires because you don't know what issues are going to come up. Very hard to predict this sort of thing. So, um, Ilya Soman, I want to bring you in the conversation a bit and, and talk a little bit about um, something that you brought up in your, your initial comments about um, foot voting vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, using the ballot box for change. I mean, I think those are, the, the case that you make in your book is that, you know, and, and that you made earlier is that um, voting may not be as good of a mechanism to bring about change in the circumstances of individuals as, as voting with your feet might be. But I think that there's this disconnect where most people don't think of things in that way. I mean, you know, we put a lot of focus as we're seeing right now in the, in the heart of an election on uh, using elections to change the people who are in power, presumably to change the policies. Um, and so, you know, voting with your feet, as I see it, is very much underemphasized, I think, by, by comparison. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why that might be. I mean, I, the conventional wisdom, I think, would be that it's just not as valuable as, as uh, the ballot, or at least maybe the, the connection isn't quite as direct as it is in the case of I vote for someone and then they're either in office or out of office. So, um, you know, do you think that people don't like to think about moving and to what degree does that play into it, whether we're talking, you know, internationally or, or within a country? Um, is there a sort of, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I wonder whether even a feeling of entitlement plays into it, where in the sense that people feel entitled to living in the place that they are living in and, and want to have the conditions, uh, you know, be whatever, they, whatever it is they want. And so they don't feel like, you know, jumping ship in a sense should be an appropriate action. So I'd like to just kind of hear your thoughts on some of those, some of those questions, why, why Americans in particular maybe don't, don't really think about things in the way that you outline in your book. Uh, so I think it's a good question, but I will start a little bit by disputing the premise, uh, which is that I think actually Americans think about moving all the time. Uh, every year, millions of people move, uh, and obviously a large percentage of Americans, some 15% or so, were actually born abroad uh, as immigrants, and so they actually, they or their parents actually did make a decision to move, uh, and all of those decisions, both domestic and international, are heavily influenced by considerations related to government policy even if they're pure economic moves, quote unquote, uh, they're still influenced by policy decisions because economic opportunities are in fact structured to a large extent by the government policies in place uh, in the uh, area that you move to. So in that sense, we think about it all the time. What I don't think people don't think about sufficiently is uh, given all the benefits of foot voting, uh, maybe we should make government policy and structure it with that in mind, with uh, the, the possibility of expanding opportunities for, for, to vote with their feet. And I think there are several reasons why that occurs. One is the very political ignorance that it ironically forms part of the case for foot voting to some extent prevents people from thinking about the issue systematically and from thinking about or even knowing about how some of our policies block effective foot voting, uh, for instance, exclusionary zoning, licensing laws, which make it very difficult to move around from state to state, or in some cases, even just from city to city. Uh, another reason which is not unique to the US, but which we've certainly seen in the US, particularly in recent years, is the rise of nationalism. So uh, when it comes to international foot voting, the issue is not just that people often don't realize the benefits, though often they don't, uh, particularly the more indirect benefits to the receiving nation. Uh, but it's also that the rise of nationalism since the 19th century has led people to feel that there must be an inherent right of governments or of particular ethnic or racial groups to exclude people. And that that's just sort of a natural attribute of the international system that we live in, or just a, a basic moral principle that is unquestioned in our minds. Whereas in reality, both nationalism generally and the implications for immigration specifically is in fact the product of the last 100 or 150 years. It's not inherently natural at all any more than say socialism, which emerged during the same period as national uh, or for that matter, you know, other ideological premises. So part of what goes on in that realm is that people just implicitly assume this is the way it is. Governments have these sorts of rights, just as for a long time, 
people accepted the divine right of kings as just a normal part of life. They accepted serfdom and slavery. Uh, indeed, the way our system of migration restrictions works is actually does have things in common with serfdom, at least in that uh, under serfdom, if you were born a serf, you were only allowed to move around with permission. Whereas if, if you were born a free person, or especially if you were born an aristocrat, you could live where you wanted. And that depended primarily on circumstances of birth and people thought it was natural. Similarly, today, whether you can live in the United States, at least to a large extent, depends on who your parents are and where you were born. It's the same kind of principle as medieval feudalism, but we think of it as natural and normal. So uh, when you hear it analogized, as I just did to feudalism, you think, well, there must be, it can't really be that way. It's, it's just a natural, normal part of life. So I think all of these factors come together, as well as some others that you know we could go into, but I don't want to take too much time to answer this question. For now, I'll merely imitate the other Ilias shameless self-promotion and point out that I too, for this book, we have a Kindle version. We also have an audio version. Both are available on the Amazon website and Barnes and Noble. They're also available on the Oxford University Press website. Uh, and while I'm obviously motivated by the desire to promote the book, I should note the motivation is not primarily financial because 50% uh, of all royalties generated by this book will be going to causes benefiting refugees who sadly given the current economic and health crisis are in an even more dire need than is usually the case. All right, so I'm gonna ask um, a question for Ilya Shapiro again. And one of the things that I think try to transition from that really good summary and answer is to talk about kind of legitimacy and perspective in general. And you've written on legitimacy before, you've talked about court legitimacy. And a part of the, one of the chapters in your book talks about this idea of legitimacy. And one of the fears you talk about is, well, kind of where we stand a legit post chapter. <laughs> it was legit. It is le at a legit perspective. And I think one of the things you concede and kind of uh, maybe you're, I don't know. There we go. There we go again. <laughs> uh, I think there may be a problem with Anthony's link. Um, well, yeah, so, so legitimacy is, is a big uh, consideration. In fact, a lot of people think that, uh, myself included, that- Does that become unsustainable <laughs> if a court becomes overwhelmingly one-sided ideolo ideologically? So um, the, the, the conventional wisdom about what John Roberts has been doing the last few years since he's become the median justice is to look out for the court's legitimacy or institutional integrity as he perceives it. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, the, the viewers to, to think about whether he's been effective uh, in that. Um, you know, my conclusion uh, is that uh, judges and justices actually do a disservice to their courts um, and and the courts and, and act least legitimately when they are thinking about legitimacy, ironically, rather than simply uh, applying their legal theories as as best they can and then letting people evaluate whether they're right or wrong. The, the person on the street doesn't think that much about the Supreme Court except, well, in general, but also uh, not except uh, uh, unless there's a, a big opinion and they either really like or really don't like that opinion. So I don't. I think it's hard to separate, kind of, in the citizen's mind, uh, the idea of the legitimacy of the court versus whether it's uh, generally, you know, deciding things in the right way. Which is why historically the Supreme Court hasn't gotten too far ahead or behind public opinion. Now, sometimes that is regionally controversial, as with the uh, Brown versus Board of Education and desegregation orders uh, in the civil rights era. Obviously, the the uh, unpopular in the South, uh, the, the impeach Earl Warren uh, 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 bumper stickers that were around in the in the 50s and 60s, although um, those Supreme Court decisions really didn't have uh, as much to do with desegregating schools in the Jim Crow South as the Civil Rights Act, as uh, President uh, Eisenhower ordering troops to different places, uh, things like that. Um, uh, you know, it's, it'll be hard to, you know, be interesting to see, I guess, if, um, if Biden wins this election and the Democrats win the Senate as well, controlling all of the federal government, 
Uh, and the Supreme Court will, uh, at this point, have six Republican appointed justices, three Democratic appointed justices. But how will they rule? You know, if, as everybody is predicting, they do not uh, strike down Obamacare uh, in June, uh, and other, uh, you know, there's no other uh, uh, cases in which they they will have a, a politically salient ruling. You know, a big asterisk with uh, election related litigation, of course. You know, whether the furor over the the court being somehow illegitimate, at least among liberal legal elites, uh, will die down in in some respects. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the court uh, generally has a lot more public confidence than the other institutions of either federal or local government, um, uh, it's down from where it has been in, in a couple of past decades, but uh, uh, still significantly better than Congress or the executive branch. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I want to inject perhaps a little bit of controversy into our discussion. So I'll, I'll go back to you, Ilya Soman. So we've, we've been talking about what are, I think, somewhat controversial topics in the sense that, you know, the, the topic of international migration is, is obviously controversial in the current moment. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned in your opening remarks that there, there are many who view, um, you know, moving within the states as, as controversial if they're doing so for, for, you know, maybe public policy reasons. I'm, I'm reminded on that front of a, a friend who uh, is an attorney in, in California who uh, absolutely loves California and is a strident libertarian, but he always says that he views the taxes that he pays in California as his cost for living in the, uh, uh, in that, in that state. And he will never, he will never move uh, that, the, that at the end of the day, it's uh, it's not a high enough cost for him personally. Um, but in your book, you talk about a third, a third type of, of foot voting, and that has to do with, with choices in the private sector. And, you know, I wanted to see if I, if I, there was some way that I could pin you down as being pro HOA, which might be the most, uh, I don't know the most controversial uh, opinion anyone could express in this in this uh, in this discussion, but um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what you mean about voting with your feet in the private sector, um, and and how you know some of these mechanisms that exist may be similar or different to uh, you know what we're talking about in both the uh, the international and the intranational context. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question. In most contexts, when I present talks or do events related to this book, the most controversial aspect is international migration, uh, but perhaps HOAs might be even more controversial in that I am, in fact, pro-HOA in this book, not in the sense that I think all of their policies are always good or that there aren't stupid rules that some HOAs have. They totally do have some stupid rules sometimes, and some of them are dysfunctional, but in the sense that they create a wide range of choice for people. Uh, we have, even in the status quo, almost 70 million Americans who live in private planned communities of various kinds. HOAs, condominium associations, uh, and various others. And there's lots of evidence that shows two things. One is they offer potentially a wider range of choice than state or local governments do because you can fit more of them in a given territory. So I can move only a few miles from where I currently live, but potentially live in a private planned community which offers a variety of services, including security, various amenities, some of them offer educational services as well, uh, and so on. Uh, so there is more choice with lower moving costs than state and local governments offer. Uh, in addition, uh, a lot of studies also suggest that the quality of services provided by uh, private planned communities, yes, including HOAs, is often better than that provided by state and local governments in the same area. Um, and uh, that's also significant as well. It increases both freedom of choice, but also happiness and well-being. So yes, it, that's entirely compatible with saying lots of HOAs have lots of stupid rules or that some of the people who sit on their boards are very annoying and they're busybodies or whatever. You've got to compare them with the alternatives like the people who run various local governments uh, or school boards, police forces and so forth. Uh, on average, not in every case, but on average, those tend to be worse. Uh, so I think uh, this form of foot voting provides many valuable opportunities already. And in the book, I present various proposals to make it more available to more people. For instance, loosening land use regulations, which make it harder to set up new private planned communities, and also addressing the problem of double taxation, where currently, if you live in a private planned community and you pay for various services that it provides, uh, you also are essentially paying for the same services from the local government. Uh, so you're double taxed. Uh, 
uh, I would like to provide discounts essentially for property taxes or other local taxes for people who live in private plan communities and therefore are not using the public version of the service. Uh, and I discuss ways that that can be compatible with redistribution to the poor in that uh, some of taxation funds redistributive programs, and at least for purpose of the present discussion, I'm not against that, uh, whereas other taxation, particularly at the state and local level, is essentially a user fee. So the user fee part, I advocate people should not have to pay if they're not, in fact, using that particular service, whereas the redistributive part has a, a different justification. Great. Well, Let's continue the theme of controversy. And so let's turn the controversy over to the Supreme Court and post in a really pre, pre uh, Justice Barrett's confirmation, court reform has been a huge part of the conversation. Should the court be reformed? Should there be a structural change on the Supreme Court? And uh, Ilya, part of, um, part of your book near the end, you weigh certain um, court reforms. You weigh the pros and cons. And at one point, I, I took a quote from the book saying, well, you're willing to consider anything that would show the difference between interpreting the law and making it between judging and legislating. So with that in mind, is there anything that sticks out? Right. Um, I'm most amenable to term limits. I agree with uh, Steve Calabresi, who's a law professor at Northwestern, who, along with his colleague Jim Lindgren, uh, wrote the seminal uh, article uh, on this almost 15 years ago, analyzing from every perspective uh, the advantages and disadvantages and how to get it done and, and all of this, and having an 18-year term, so vacancy every two years, each presidential term would thus get two vacancies, uh, like clockwork, that would do uh, good things for public confidence in the court because it would get rid of these morbid health watches over octogenarian justices or politically timed retirements, the seeming arbitrariness of when these vacancies uh, occur. Uh, so that's good. Uh, what it would not do would be ideologically rebalance the court, uh, change the uh, issues that the court is called upon to address uh, and its power, therefore. And so it would reduce the size of the battles to the extent that battling over a seat for 18 years is less powerful than a seat over, you know, that could be 30 years or, or, or more. Uh, but that's, you know, one and a half cheers for term limits. And it would take a constitutional amendment, by the way. Other things, whether expanding the size of the court or rotating through lower court judges without having any permanent justices, there's been a lot of creative uh, proposals uh, by uh, a lot of different academics, sometimes journalists. Some of these have been picked up by politicians on the campaign trail. Uh, these are either completely unworkable uh, or would further politicize the court rather than solving the problem to the extent as people think of it in political or even worse partisan terms. You know, there's one proposal that you have 15 justices, five of whom are picked by Republicans, five by Democrats, and five by unanimous vote of, of these others. Well, how are you supposed to depoliticize a court by having two thirds of its members with an explicit partisan label? That's, you know, too clever by half, really. But at the end of the day, all of these proposals, and I talk about a lot of them, uh, are nibbling around the, the edges. They're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Because the problem isn't with the process, it's with the product of what the court does. Uh, the Titanic is the ship of state. Over, this, over decades, we've had the centralization of power, and within Washington, within the federal government, a skewing of that power away from the legislative branch to the executive branch, either in terms of executive actions, but even more so the administrative state, uh, which uh, promulgates most of the rules and regulations by which we live our daily lives, at least from the federal level. And so the only way long term to uh, turn down the heat on these confirmation battles is to rebalance our constitutional order by pushing decision making back down to the local and, and state uh, level uh, to give the people back their, their power that way uh, and within Washington to have Congress have again uh, more relative power to force Congress, meaning by through legislative action on what lawyers call the non-delegation doctrine and otherwise to force Congress to hash out those policy clashes rather than punting it to the administrative branch. Now, obviously this is not an easy solution. It's not an overnight solution. Uh, but uh, we didn't get to where we are uh, overnight or, or, or easily either. Yeah, I think that's I think that's accurate. I think I do a lot of work on, on budget policy, which is sort of a microcosm of exactly what you're talking about there. It's an issue we see we see all the time. Um, 
and this goes along with uh, dovetails to to Ilya Soman's work because you know ultimately let California be California and Texas be Texas. Um, there's no reason that there needs to be a one size fits all healthcare system for the entire country any more than there needs to be uh, the same zoning uh, rules in in every city. Uh, and that you know because we have a large diverse pluralistic society, um, you know, uh, not having Washington make the decisions for, for everybody, I think would go a long way to, uh, you know, resolving our, uh, our differences, or at least uh, turning down the heat in our discourse. I think that's right. I think there are a lot of us who would, who would agree with that. As, but as you point out, the, the challenge is getting from A to B. Um, I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Ilya Soman, some of the objections that you that you address in, in your book. So you, you sort of, um, you know, you go through the, the litany of, of uh, I think, common objections that exist to, uh, to increase migration, and you sort of bat them down one by one. But I wonder if there are um, arguments on that front that you find more convincing than others. So, you know, we're all familiar with, you know, Milton Friedman's famous line, for example, about the incompatibility of, of you know, relatively open borders and a, and a welfare state. Um, you know, what if it were true that you know uh, immigrants provided you know some sort of significant burden on the welfare state, or that um, I don't know jobs or wages were adversely affected? Setting aside the fact that, it, as we know, most of the evidence shows that, that that is not the case, but I wonder if you would find these arguments convincing in that uh, in that in that context, um, or are there other are there reasons those arguments should not uh, change people's minds, regardless of what the what the the data or the sort of hard evidence says? Yeah, um, so it's an interesting question. The welfare state argument I don't find especially convincing, even relative to other arguments in this area that are unconvincing, and that is so partly because, as you noted, the evidence suggests both in the U.S. and Europe that places with a higher percent percentage of immigrants don't actually have a higher welfare state burden, but also because there's a relatively simple fix for that problem if it were a problem, which is just limit immigrants eligibility for welfare benefits, which we already do under the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, but you could extend that further if you wanted to. So there, uh, uh, there's both, it's a problem that's actually not really in existence, but if it was, there's an easy fix, what I call a keyhole solution. So when I look at these sort of practical objections, I have a three-step framework which I apply, which is A, ask if there is a real problem. Often the answer is in this case is that there isn't. B, if there is a real problem, it ask is there a keyhole solution that is a way to address the problem without keeping people out. And then C, if there really is a problem and there is no feasible keyhole solution, I would ask, uh, can we use some of the vast wealth generated by migration uh, to tap into it and make up for it? And here too, uh, that vast wealth could potentially pay for more welfare programs or more welfare burdens if there really was uh, that issue. Uh, of the list of objections that I go through in my book, I think the one that is the most potentially compelling, though I think it actually isn't in most cases, but is the one that most deserves consideration, is the possibility of so-called political externalities. That is, immigrants of a certain type or a certain set of political views or cultures might come in and influence government policy for the worse. And in principle, that could happen to such a great extent that you destroy the sort of the goose that weighs the golden egg so that the policies become so bad that the country is no better than the one that the immigrants were fleeing from in the first place. And that in principle could happen for any number of reasons. The immigrants might be ignorant voters as domestic voters also often are. They might have bad cultural or political values. There might be ethnic conflict between the two groups and so forth. In the book, I have a long list of answers to this and the empirical evidence, particularly for the US and Canada uh, and other Anglophone democracy just simply doesn't support the notion that this is a problem. But in principle, it could be. And the places where I think it's most likely to be is where you have a small, relatively liberal society with a large, very illiberal neighbor. And uh, if you allow migration from the illiberal neighbor, potentially the illiberal people could very out quickly outnumber the more liberal natives. Uh, so the example I use the case of Estonia right next to Russia. Estonia is a very small country. The Russian population on average has quite a liberal views on a number of issues. Uh, and in theory, if 
uh, Russians could migrate freely to Estonians. You might, they might quickly outnumber the Estonians. And you could still address this through the keyhole solution of restricting eligibility for the franchise. But it's possible that if you have a sufficiently large numerical disproportion, that might not be stable over time. But the vast majority of places in the world are not in the position of Estonia relative to Russia. And also there are a wide variety of keyhole mechanisms uh, and also just ordinary assimilation, which the data shows works quite well. Uh, if uh, you simply just allow people to enter the labor market in the country, they enter. That turns out to be a, uh, a very powerful assimilative measure. Even in the case of quite illiberal populations, I would note the instance of Israel, where in a relatively short period of time, they went from only a very small proportion of the population being immigrants from Russia and the former Soviet Union to it being about 20 or 25 percent. And yet that did virtually no detectable damage to Israel's liberal institutions. Uh, the other Ilya's colleague, Alex Navrastek, uh, with a series of co-authors, has some good articles that he's written about the Israel experience. So that suggests that even a short, a, a, a swift move from uh, all the way up to 20 or 30 percent of a nation's population being migrants from an illiberal society need not be a problem. And indeed, it was actually an asset. Uh, but in principle, if you have enough over a short enough period of time and the illiberalism was great enough, then uh, the keyhole solution might not work. Uh, you can also imagine other more extreme situations like in, in the book, and we briefly advert to this, but I've recently talked about and other writings, migration restrictions related to coronavirus. I think we actually don't need them to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. The 14 day quarantine is more than enough to take care of the problems and would take care of it better. But in principle, you can imagine a, a still more deadly and more contagious disease where for whatever reason, quarantine just doesn't work. And then migration restrictions might be the only way to keep it out. You can imagine also other kinds of more far-fetched scenarios. It is not my view that freedom of movement is an absolute right, but I do think it's a very strong presumptive principle that can only be overcome if this three-part test that I laid out is uh, dealt with. The last point that I'll mention is that all of these sorts of objections, welfare state, uh, political externalities, spread of disease, and, and many others, if you take them seriously, they apply just as much to internal migration uh, as to international Texans and right-wing Texans. I know some of them do worry about this. They might say, well, if, if too many Californians move to Texas, they'll make Texas just as dysfunctional from their point of view, at least as California is. Uh, if too many West Virginians move to Virginia, West Virginia is a much poorer state. They might overburden our wonderful Commonwealth of Virginia welfare state uh, and so on. So uh, if you want to be consistent about these sorts of issues uh, and if you want to say anytime there's any chance at all of this sort of problem, we can keep people out, then the same principle might apply to West Virginians and Californians uh, and so on. Or perhaps uh, my, most most controversially, you may have uh, a, a lot of annoying people moving into your HOA. So it also <laughs> yeah. Uh, so an so so HOA is somewhat different in that uh, in the book I discussed the analogy that some people make between a nation and a private club, and some people say, well, if you can keep people out of your private club, the nation should have the same sorts of powers. And I discuss many ways in which nations and clubs are dissimilar, and therefore that analogy doesn't hold. An HOA, by contrast, is like a private club and therefore I think should have more of a right to exclude. And this gives me the chance to shamelessly take the opportunity to address a question I saw in the comments about whether HOAs contribute to structural racism. It depends perhaps on your definition of racism, but in general, if racism means sort of segregation and keeping racial minorities from moving to where they want, local and state governments are by far the bigger culprits historically than private arrangements are in that an HOA, even if it's very racist, and even if there are no uh, anti-discrimination laws, it can keep people out, out only out, out of a relatively small area. Uh, and there, there can be other HOAs and other organizations in the area that might be more open to diversity. And in fact, in this day and age, more of them are. By contrast, exclusionary zoning, for example, can keep people out of entire huge regions like San Francisco, New York City, Los Angeles and others. Uh, and similarly with licensing restrictions and the like. So uh, if, you, if you think that even a small degree of racial discrimination is impermissible, we can and we in fact already have uh, anti-discrimination laws that apply even to the 
uh, private sector HOAs that specifically forbid discrimination on the basis of race and religion and some other criteria. Uh, but even if you didn't have that, uh, the risk that HOAs would massively create structural racism, I argue, is relatively low because even if some, uh, a few particular HOAs are exclusionary, uh, large numbers of others would not be. Indeed, there would be market incentives for them to attract uh, productive people of all races and ethnicities, both because that profits the HOA and because in this day and age, many people actually have preferences to live in more diverse areas, particularly younger, more educated people. Uh, they want to live in areas which are relatively more diverse, and therefore they don't want to live in a lily white neighborhood where it's only whites or a neighborhood which is, you know, only people of a particular religion and so forth. Uh, not everybody has preferences for diversity like that, but a very large number of people do, particularly younger and more affluent and more educated ones who are often precisely the sorts that HOAs and other private plan communities want to attract. My friends at the Goldwater Institute in Phoenix like to say that if, uh, if we want to uh, attract uh, hardworking entrepreneurial people and keep out lazy socialists, then we should build a wall on Arizona's western border, not its southern one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave a talk at Arizona State or the virtual talk at Arizona State about my book recently and there were some of the Arizona conservatives there who said well you know I see your analogy between international and internal migration I largely agree with it but the inference that I draw is that we should find some way for Arizona to be able to keep out Californians and I do have some responses to that but in general, most people are not willing to bite that bullet. So my initial argument works, but for those who are, I have a different set of responses that are they also mm -hmm. make in the book and we can perhaps get into that uh, later. If you don't like these principles, don't worry, I have others, right? <laughs> I would say that I have others which are completely consistent with my first set of principles. It's called, <laughs> to use a lawyerly term, it's an argument in the alternative. Uh, but the argument in the alternative is still consistent with the initial argument. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't depend on contradictory premises. Well, I wanted to use the, the last couple of minutes to try to wrap up some of the questions that a couple of people submitted near the beginning of the hour. One, I think Ilya already answered it. it um, wanted you to... Oh no, did we lose Anthony again? <laughs> I, I fear that we did. I, I don't yeah. see I don't see any submitted questions. So I'll, I'll, re I'll, re I'll read them aloud. So so one of the questions asks, uh, it says, I hope to hear Ilya Shapiro. Asks a little bit of a history lesson about Lincoln <laughs> and and the nominations that um, Lincoln had and what were his considerations. And I wonder if you can tie that with perhaps Lincoln and others in the past. What considerations were they making for Supreme Court nominees? And maybe let's make some predictions. Um, if pre if uh, Vice President Biden were to win. Um, next week, what sort of nominees would he be looking for? Would it be very similar to the nominees that President Obama was looking to? And maybe with that, how do you expect or how do you predict those confirmation hearings to go with uh, either it's a Republican controlled Senate or a democratically controlled Senate? Right. So uh, Lincoln was, of course, elected in, in 1860, where uh, the, 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 the drums of war were already sounding. Um, and so he was concerned about a, you know, trying to unite the country, and b, having the executive power to act uh, decisively, whether in war or otherwise, to to keep it together. Um, so uh, he thought he sought allies. He famously had a team of rivals in his cabinet. So he also wanted to uh, placate different factions within his own party. This was one of the reasons why in 1864, when there was a vacancy a month before the election, Kamala Harris got this wrong. I don't know whether on purpose or not at the vice presidential debate, but he did not keep that vacancy open uh, because of some norm of not filling vacancies so close to election, but because he, uh, well, first of all, the Senate physically was not in session. And in those days, you can just fly back to deal with business like that. They, they, he wouldn't be, have been able to confirm someone. In theory, he could have recess appointed. Recess appointments were uh, more common, even of Supreme Court justices in those days. Uh, but more importantly, uh, while he was prosecuting the war uh, and his reelection campaign, he didn't want, he wanted all of his supporters on the same same side, uh, pulling their oar uh, for the team effort and uh, appointing somebody would have uh, alienated uh, his supporters, whether for the election or the prosecution of the war. And so uh, after the election is when he ended up uh, uh, nominating and confirming someone which did cause some uh, bad feelings for those not selected and their supporters. But uh, anyway, uh, strong executive power was his paramount, uh, what, what he was looking for. And uh, 
you know, these things changed uh, uh, by president. It wasn't purely uh, judicial philosophy. Uh, some were regional balance, some were uh, crossing party lines for, for some sort of balance that way. Uh, Herbert Hoover nominated uh, Benjamin Cardozo, even though he knew uh, that he wasn't necessarily going to be uh, uh, of the same judicial philosophy that Hoover himself might be, but just because he felt the Democrats needed more representation and, and things like that. So uh, again, there are political considerations um, uh, came into it uh, in, in all sorts of ways. Eisenhower, I mentioned a recess appointment in 1956, a month before the election. Eisenhower recess appointed Bill Brennan, even though it was very clear that Brennan, who had been on the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, was uh, very much a progressive, very much on the left uh, in terms of jurisprudence. But Eisenhower felt that uh, in the immediate, he needed to shore up his political support among Catholics, among Northeastern metropolitan voters. And he succeeded in that. He uh, you know, increased his his vote and, and, and did very well in that regard, beating uh, Adlai Stevenson uh, again, um, but was stuck with uh, Brennan's jurisprudence uh, for the longer term. Well, that's great. And, um, and I should note, by the way, that it's it's another kind of confluence of between two ferns and between two Ilias is that uh, uh, both of us, uh, like most immigrants, because we are ourselves, uh, we do uh, a job that most native-born Americans won't, and that's defending the Constitution. <laughs> I, I wonder if we have a moment, I thought, and you're free to reject this, maybe each of us could perhaps pose a question to the other, because I've read Ilya's book, I think he has read or at least seen at least parts of mine, uh, and some of our interests intersect with what the other one has, has written. Would that be okay? Yeah, I think that'd be great. And I was I was going to end with uh, just a question of how optimistic you each are for the reforms that you propose in, in your book. So maybe something else worth, uh, uh, worth talking briefly about as well. Okay. Should I go first and answer sure. that question or should be? Uh, so, so I'm not optimistic that sort of my full vision of vastly expanded foot voting will be achieved in the near future. But I am optimistic that there can be incremental movement in the right direction. Uh, if you look domestically, even as I was writing the book over the last couple of years, there emerged a movement on both right and left, though more on the left, to reform zoning laws, which are the biggest obstacle to effective internal migration within the U.S. Uh, reforms have been passed in a number of different states, including Oregon, even the state of California, which is the very worst on this. It has had a, a serious effort at reform, which so far has not passed, but the very fact that it's on the table is a big change for the better. Uh, on the international migration side, obviously, from my perspective, what's happened under Donald Trump has been awful. However, when you look at the trend of opinion, uh, it has been moving in a pro-immigration direction. Moreover, in both the US and in Europe, younger, more highly educated people are more pro-immigration than older, less educated people. And the people who are young now, obviously, will be an increasing proportion of the electorate over time. And the data shows that this is not a matter of when you're 20 years old, you're pro-immigrant, but when you're 40, you're not anymore. It's that in each succeeding generation, people have relatively stable, more pro-immigration attitudes compared to uh, older people. It's similar to the issue of same-sex marriage or marijuana legalization, where there's this generational change as well. So, I hope that there can be incremental improvements of various kinds on both of these fronts and in both internal migration and international and in both areas, even incremental improvements can make a big difference. Uh, if we reduce zoning in the most restrictive areas in the US by say 10 or 20%, that's hundreds of thousands of people that can live in areas with greater opportunity. Uh, if we increase immigration to the US by 10% every year, that's about 100,000 people per year, which is a lot of people. Uh, and similarly with uh, immigration to Europe and so forth. Uh, and there are incremental ways to increase opportunities for private sector foot voting as well. Uh, so I guess I sh I'll turn it over to Ilya Shapiro to answer the question yeah, about his Well, I mean, the, the, you know, I'm not I'm not very optimistic in the short term that anything's going to be done. There has to be some sort of hetero heterogeneous shock, right? That's that's a term that uh, in this working group, I'm sure you hear a lot among you economists, but because uh, um, uh, there's just a ratcheting up of tensions uh, over this issue and it doesn't look like the fever is going to break uh, anytime soon, whether the Democrats do, uh, if, they, if they win the trifecta in this election, whether they do attempt court packing or not, or what the outcome of Biden's uh, proposed uh, uh, court reform commission might be. 
um, you know, we might be in a, in a realignment of parties and that always uh, changes people's pr perspectives on things. Uh, but in line with that, I wanted to ask Ilya Soman, um, you know, we've seen uh, that uh, executive power, uh, whatever it is, isn't enough to change fundamental policy, that there needs to be a, a, a reform of our immigration laws uh, by Congress to, to have any sustained uh, change. And we haven't had a major immigration law since 1996. Uh, Bush came close in 2006, 2007. Obama probably had the political capital early on, but chose to spend it on, on health care. Um, but what kind of, uh, you know, political shifts are necessary to be able to have um, a, a, a lasting, sustained, legislated uh, change to our immigration laws? And kind of related to that is, um, you know, uh, how will public opinion, you know, historically, obviously, there have been times where Americans have been more or against uh, uh, immigration. I think it's largely correlated to, to the percentage of people who are uh, uh, native born or, or foreign born rather in society. When that drops, then, you know, they start becoming more amenable to it rising again and, and vice versa. But anyway, uh, those types of questions. Yeah. So there's really two good questions there, and I'm not sure I can fully do justice to them in the time we have, uh, but let me answer both of them as best as I can. One is how will reform happen, if at all? I do agree lasting sustainable reform uh, does probably require legislation, though I would note I think both Obama and Trump have actually been able to make major changes in various ways without legislation. And at least one of those changes, DACA, may prove to be relatively durable, albeit less durable than Obama probably thought it was going to be when, when he put it in place. Uh, obviously, the very immediate prospect for big legislation may not be so great. But I think in the medium term, uh, there could be more favorable environment for two reasons. Uh, one is, as I mentioned before, younger, more highly educated people are more pro-immigration uh, and those people the people who are young now plus more highly educated people will over time form an increasing percentage uh, of the population. Uh, a second uh, reason is that, and I could, this one, you know, it's harder to predict, but uh, it seems to me that the the Republican Party, even if Trump somehow ekes out a victory uh, in a few days, it's uh, trapping itself in a narrow or narrow demographic corner where they're the party of lesser educated whites. Uh, and, uh, 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 and that is going to be a, a smaller and smaller fraction of population. So they will need to find ways to try to break out of that to appeal to other groups. Just as you mentioned before, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, one of the reasons why Brennan got appointed is because Republicans were trying to appeal to what were then called white ethnics, including white Catholics and others. So similarly, they will need to appeal again to more highly educated people and also to non-whites. And I certainly don't think that the way they're going to do that is by being as open borders as I am, but they may need to be at least incrementally less hostile to immigration than they've become over the last several years. Uh, the sort of cruelty of some of their immigration policies is part of what's alienated highly educated voters and others from them, the family separation policy, for example, but also uh, other things. Uh, finally, uh, I think that uh, if you look in past history, uh, the way we've made progress on things like civil rights for African Americans, equality for women, uh, same-sex marriages, so forth, is by gradually getting more people to see that the distinctions that previously existed in the law that were taken for granted are actually morally invidious and arbitrary. We now recognize, uh, as I said before, that it's not just to distinguish between people based on whether their parents are serfs as opposed to nobles, and similarly, whether their parents are black or white. The distinction between people who are born in the US and people who are born elsewhere or people who have US citizen parents versus other kinds of parents is morally arbitrary in much the same way. And the idea behind, and it's not actually a difficult idea to explain once you start doing it. So I think that kind of moral change can happen over time as well, uh, particularly if immigration advocates realize that it might be desirable to start making that kind of argument as opposed to some of the other kinds of arguments that uh, they have been more focused on in recent years. Uh, I think the, uh, the second question is about sort of the history of the rise and fall of pro-immigration attitudes. Some people do argue, as you just suggested, that 
Uh, they fall and rise based on the percentage of immigrants in the American population. I actually think the evidence doesn't support that because when you ask people in surveys, what is the percentage of native born versus immigrants, they tend to get that systematically wrong. Uh, and both in the US and other countries, they tend to greatly overestimate it. Uh, what, it what, what correlates with it more historically is how good or how bad economic conditions are. Uh, that in the late 19th century was the first big background against immigrations that correlated with the, the quasi depression of that period. Uh, the 1930s was another similar period and, and, and so forth. What's interesting about the current situation is that when the coronavirus crisis hit and the accompanying very severe recession, I thought that's, that's very bad for the cause of immigration. Opinion will turn negative, but interestingly, it hasn't. It has actually continued to slightly creep upwards in a more favorable uh, direction. So we don't yet know why that occurred and why this time has been sort of an exception. I have some theories, but those theories could easily be wrong. But that actually regard as a hopeful sign uh, that it hasn't happened that way. It hasn't happened that way in Europe either. Uh, that I thought right wing nationalists, I thought right wing nationalists might make big gains out of the coronavirus crisis, and maybe they still will. But so far, it hasn't happened uh, in either the U.S. Uh, or uh, in Western Europe. So that I regard as a a hopeful sign uh, as well, albeit uh, if the crisis goes on for several more years, uh, you know, I don't know if that will be maintained or not. Uh, I would like to also now pose a question to you. And as you mentioned, um, uh, we agree on a desirability of greater decentralization of power. I think there's many benefits to that and that part of that might be stronger judicial enforcement of federalism limits. And I think that has a lot of advantages voting with your feet, more room for diversity, less dangerous concentration of power in one person, the president or in government bureaucrats. But I do wonder whether that will really diffuse the conflict over the courts that you discuss in your book in that it seems to me a lot of the conflict is actually over issues related to judicial review of state and local legislation, affirmative action, gun control, abortion, uh, a number of other issues, even campaign finance, it's often state legislation rather than federal. So I wonder, will it really diffuse uh, those sorts of conflicts uh, that, uh, you know, uh, if anything, if there is more room for variation between states over things like abortion, for example, then that might uh, lead to even more conflict uh, over, uh, you know, over Supreme Court appointments about what will they do about these sorts of issues that are controlled at the state level, or would be even yes. more controlled at the state um, level now. I mean, uh, the, the, if you enforce federalism and the separation of powers, even in the exact way that I, you know, my constitutional theory directs, you wouldn't eliminate these problems, which I call the Fourteenth Amendment problems. That is the review of uh, claims that a, a state or, or locality is violating individual rights uh, and, and going to federal court to vindicate those rights, whether it be abortion or guns or you're right, racial preferences or, or, or whatever, you still definitely would have uh, those kinds of cases. Um, so, you know, we'll have fights, the court would still matter, judges would still matter, um, but I think a lot less if at least you remove the um, administrative law claims, the kind of uh, Obamacare, you know, federal programs type uh, issues uh, and, uh, you know, giving states a lot more wiggle room than they currently have, um, you know, you, you would have different types of abortion regulations in, in, in different places, certainly, and different types of uh, gun regulations in different places for that matter. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, there, there, you would still need uh, judicial enforcement of a, of a basic floor of, of federal constitutional rights. Well, great. Uh, well, I think that's all the time we have. As someone who is descended from long lines of Eastern European serfs, I uh, thank you both for the, uh, the some often yeoman's work that you, you all are doing. But uh, and thank you, Anthony, for your insightful questions as well. And uh, everyone who, uh, who listened in, I guess I'll just say, uh, if you're interested in these topics, by all means, please, uh, uh, please do consider purchasing each of these books. They're both very interesting reads. And um, look forward to, to joining everyone uh, next month at our uh, next official meeting of the, the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. So um, thank you both again, and uh, thanks all for joining. Thank you.